I'm Nicholas Bornois of Capital Inc. I will be very brief. I just wanted to thank you all for joining this tremendous panel. This panel, I think, addresses one of the most critical uh, topics of the industry today, and it's a particularly timely discussion given all the regulatory developments uh, right now. So I will let uh, Simon Petz, the uh, partner from uh, Watson, Farley & Williams, to introduce our distinguished uh, panelists. And thank you to everybody for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And, and thank you to, to the panel. Um, I think we have our, our work cut out for us following, as we do, Dr. Martin Stockford. Um, and, and possibly because many of you will have had some lunch quite recently, but we will do our best to keep you informed um, and entertained a bit. Um, so our subject today, decarbonisation, policy making at the crossroads, and who will pay the bill? Um, the billion dollar question, one would argue it's, it's, it's more than a billion dollars. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the panel I'm joined by, a distinguished panel, um, comprising uh, Mr. Lars Robert Pedersen, the Deputy Secretary General of BIMCO, we have Mr. Dilbos Filis, uh, Vice President and President-Elect of the European Community of Shipowners Association and CEO at uh, Limisola Navigation. Uh, we have Ms. Magda Kopczynska, uh, who's the Director for Waterborne and Director General for Mobility and Transport of the European Commission. Mr. Guy Platten, Secretary General, International Chamber of Shipping. And Mr. Hiroyuki Yamada, Director, Marine Environment Division, the IMO. Um, as Nicholas said, I'm Simon Petch, a, a partner specializing in the maritime sector at Watson, Farley and Williams. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be joining you here at London International Shipping Week, uh, not least because I spent the last nine and a half odd years in, in Asia and Singapore. And so it's very nice to, uh, to see you back here. Um, so we've heard a lot about the challenge, um, both this morning and generally. Um, I think just to very quickly summarize, um, as we know, it's, it's not a challenge that is li limited only to shipping. Um, it's, it's a global challenge. It impacts on the poorest to the wealthiest countries in the world. Um, it covers the full ESG spectrum, environmental, social and governance. It covers both public and private sectors. It embraces technology, economics, finance, politics. Um, and it's the start of a long process um, without necessarily a clear roadmap. Uh, but there is an ever-growing feeling of the need to act now. So back to who is going to pay for it. Um, now, we had took the liberty, the panel and I, of having a conversation last week to, to brainstorm what we were going to talk to you about. Um, one of the things that did come up was the various initiatives already in play. Um, the main ones we, we, we um, touched upon were the uh, EU mission training schemes, Fuel EU, um, we have the International Chamber of Shipping Research and Development Fund, and the International Chamber of Shipping Global Levy. So if I could start with you, Guy, and then Magda after, just to summarize briefly the, uh, the initiatives um, on the part of the ICS uh, and some of the thinking behind them. Yeah, thanks very much, Simon, and uh, really good to speak to everyone today, um, drawing LISW. Um, so there's two things really which we, we've got in there. The first, which is in conjunction with a large number of other associations. So we don't take the credit uh, for, for that as well. This really is a, an international collaboration, a research and development fund, which would be paid for by a small levy on fuel of $2 per tonne. Um, we, that's uh, going through the IM at the moment. It's now being co-sponsored by a, a, a number of governments and it's going to be discussed at the next MEPC. It could realise up to $5 billion, which will then take technology to technology readiness levels, which can allow deployment of the zero carbon fuel ships. So it's something that can be up and running very quickly, we believe, within two years, if you've got agreement at IMO, and that's just the political agreement there. And it could really make a difference as we uh, move to zero carbon. But we recognise that we're going to have to um, incentivise people to take up the new zero carbon fuels as they developed. So we've also submitted along with Intercargo, a proposal for a levy based market based measure, which could actually build on the architecture designed for the R&D fund. We believe it can be done legally through uh, changes to existing conventions, for example, the MARPOL conventions. Um, it, uh, it, it would ensure that there's no market distortion uh, there's a level playing field and we anticipate the money being paid into an IMO climate fund and that climate fund would then be used to accelerate decarbonisation, particularly in the developing nations as well. 
Uh, again, this fund could be set up relatively quickly. This sorry, this this levy market based measure could be set up relatively quickly. Should there be the political will to do so? So I think we we haven't deliberately set a price. Uh, per tonne for of the fuels. It'll depend on the, the CO2 intensity of the fuels. That I think is something for, for further analysis and discussion, but it has to be set at a level which will um, incentivize the early movers, but also bridge the gap between the zero carbon fuels and of course the existing fossil fuels as well. Thank you very much, Guy. Um, Magdriff, could I get you briefly to summarize the, the EU uh, initiatives I mentioned as well? Uh, thank you very much, Simon. A very good afternoon to you, to other panelists, and of course to everybody who's been uh, watching us uh, until now, and I hope you will also continue for the next hour. Um, two years ago, when President von der Leyen took the job of President of the European Commission, she very clearly declared that the decarbonisation or greening will be one of the key priorities for her commission. Of course, in the meantime, COVID happened, which then became at moments the, the more the more the more urgent priority. But the green objectives have not disappeared. And with the Green Deal communication with the climate law uh, put on the table uh, a year ago, the commission started to work on on a on a on a big number of proposals addressing the entire economy. Because what the president said very strongly and clearly two years ago with the imminent crisis stemming from from climate uh, from from well, climate crisis it is not any single sector that will have to contribute but it will be important for all sectors to come in and do a joint effort which also meant that we on the on the part of the European Commission started to look into how we can best address that when it comes to maritime transport sector and one thing we agreed upon is that it, it cannot be done with just one single measure. What we want to do is to come up with a basket of measures which looks at ships, which looks at fuel supply, which looks at infrastructure, and in addition, adds the element of putting a price on carbon also when it comes to maritime. And I listened very carefully to, to what Guy said, and it's very much welcome that there are now proposals coming from the industry, looking at putting price on carbon. Although, of course, as Guy said, the level of the price will be the tricky point to discuss. But what will be also happening at the IMO level, which is very much pushed for by European Union, but also by several countries from outside the EU, is to come up with a, with a standard for fuel so that fuels in shipping are getting more and more decarbonized. And those two dimensions, a price on carbon, or a carbon pricing measure and a fuel standard is exactly what we put on the table as part of Fit for 55, the, the big package put on the table in July for shipping, looking at extending emission trading scheme, a European scheme for, car, for, for, for pricing carbon and introducing fuel EU maritime, a proposal that will, that will impose requirements for reduction of greenhouse gas intensity of fuels used by ships when they call at EU ports. I'm saying that in those two uh, setups, because I think it's very important that, that everybody remembers that what we are doing at the EU is closely reflected at what we are pushing at the IMO level. I'll stop here. I'm sure we'll have a possibility to come back to that later. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. Uh, I'm going to bring in uh, Lars Robert now, if I may, um, and, and to ask you uh, the, the fundamental challenges you see it and, and looking at the, uh, the, the um, solutions that Guy and Magda are, are talking about. Do you see a do you see the levy and fund approach or, or do you see it as emissions trading and, and carbon pricing approach or, or a combination of the two? Thank you, Simon, and, and, and uh, thank you to all the organizers for inviting us in to sit on this panel and discuss this, this very critical issue that, that faces all of us. And, and uh, well, the fundamental of the challenge, I think, is, is evident for all. We need to put less carbon into the atmosphere, potentially actually even reducing the carbon that's in the atmosphere already. So, so I mean, uh, that, that's no secret and everybody knows that. And, and that's also why we all support uh, in industry the, the IMO strategy to, to decarbonize the shipping industry. The, the, the more uh, immediate challenge we have is really how to do that. And as Guy said, you know, we, we still lack uh, to some extent 
not the you could say the basic uh, theoretical concepts of how to do it. I think we all understand the physics uh, around decarbonization and 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 also uh, how you could even uh, synthesize uh, fuels with uh, which are carbon free. But but the challenge is how do we get these fuels made available to ships to burn actually, um, or how could we potentially even use the fuels we we have today and decarbonize the exhaust uh, if that was a solution uh, that 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 we could could actually use. Uh, so so we really don't know in details how we can have the industry to decarbonize at this point. But we know it can be done, uh, and and we need uh, something to to gear up to really ramp up uh, the availability of solutions uh, to the industry. And to do that, uh, we we need money. It seems uh, these are expensive solutions, especially the the new fuels uh, which which lack the uh, the carbon in them. Um, and 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 the. The fundamental of that challenge is not so much, you know, to, to synthesize them. It's really to get the the uh, uh, sustainable energy to do that. Uh, and we know in the world that uh, sustainable energy is a scarce resource. So it's not just for the shipping industry to deal with this. It's not just for the fuel producers to deal with it. It is actually for the for the wider community uh, or the society really to, to ramp up the availability of sustainable energy to allow this uh, revolution, you could say, in our energy supply uh, globally, uh, not just for the shipping industry, because we will be in competition of using uh, these uh, energy streams, these sustainable energy streams uh, with all the other sectors of society because they also need to decarbonize. So it's really a huge, huge challenge. Um, we, we have uh, witnessed uh, very recently the uh, uh, Maersk line uh, having uh, ordered some uh, ships to burn uh, green methanol and, and really the challenge is to get the green methanol for eight ships, but actually would uh, probably require the in, entire uh, sustainable energy production of the country of Denmark to feed these eight ships on an annual basis. And to feed the, the entire industry, we probably need uh, 200 times the, the renewable installation in, in the country of, of, of Denmark, just as an example. So, and this is just for the shipping industry. Then you have the aviation industry, you have the, the other transport industries, and, and we could go on. So it's really a huge scaling up issue that we are facing, and it requires money to do that, a lot of money. Um, so going into the actual approach on how do we then, when we have all these, uh, the right measures available, how do we get them into the industry? That is a probably the, the smallest of the problems right now, uh, because we even if we did put a hefty price on carbon, as we speak right now, um, it would not solve the issue. We still don't have the availability of the fundamental uh, sustainable energy resources to, to feed this. So it's way too early to discuss, is it a fund proposal? Is it an, uh, an emission trading proposal? Is it something else that will eventually be the instrument to drive the transition to happen. We need the fundamentals in place to actually allow the transition to start in the first place. And we're not even there. I think I'll stop here. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much, Lars Robert. Um, if, if, Peter Christopher, if I could bring you in, perhaps to answer um, the same question as I posed to Lars Robert, um, and, and to draw again on the, the hurdles that the, uh, the industry and the initiatives um, that they face. Uh, thank you, Simon, and thank you, Kavila Link, for inviting me also to this panel. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me start first by the statement that the ship owners always abide by the rules and comply with all regulations. I will bring uh, to the table two recent examples. Ballast water management system, where as soon as the equipment was available, approved by MON uh, and also by US Coast Guard, all the ships, based on their uh, schedule, they proceeded to retrofit and install the equipment. And the second is the low sulfur regulation, uh, the 2020 regulation, where all ships, 1st of January 2020, were 
in compliance with the regulation. Why I bring these two uh, uh, issues on the table? Because there was a common characteristic, uh, which was the enforcement mechanisms in place. And I'm not aware of any breaches so far. In any way, if we're talking about the UTS and specifically fuel EU, there is no enforcement mechanism in place and this will create a lot of problems. Going now to ETS, uh, ETS is not fit for the purpose uh, for shipping. Uh, with one reason, we as owners, we charter our ships out and we are not able to factor in uh, our charter parties a fluctuating carbon price like ETS is aiming for. Uh, this is also why we support a market-based measure at IMO level, which is a levy based on CO2 emissions because of the conversion factor. I think uh, Guy mentioned that uh, very clearly. And uh, in this respect, we propose to you a similar to levy uh, market-based measure proposal at IMO level, which of course uh, has to be adjusted to take into account the design of factions of uh, EU ETS system. Uh, we know that and we will, will accept any adjustments relevant to the, uh, the system. Uh, I refer here to the proposal of a climate fund for shipping under EUS, where we, we need a fixed carbon price throughout the year, based of course on the average uh, EU ETS of the most likely the previous year. Uh, and here, uh, it reminds me to the early 2000 when we introduced first the banker adjustment factor, uh, where we use the fuel price average and, and, and we estimated the recovery curve to reflect the actual fluctuation of the fuel. Uh, here, we must apply a similar system and we, we need the technocrats to uh, design how this will be in place. Uh, it's important though to say that this uh, idea uh, has been supported from a wide range of stakeholders and institutions, uh, ranging from the European Parliament to several environmental NGOs. Uh, few advantages of the system of the Climate Fund is that all revenues will be used to bridge uh, the price gap between clear and cleaner fuels and conventional fuels. We'll remove uh, any administrative burden uh, to the SMEs. Uh, and of course, SMEs cannot afford uh, to create a department trading with carbon. We are Large associations, large, large organizations may uh, have already established desk uh, and may take advantage uh, of the uh, arbitrage between the carbon exchanges and secure the allowances they need. Uh, whereas SMEs cannot do that. They don't have the financial means, they don't have the personnel, the capabilities. Uh, this will create a stability and of course will help uh, the SMEs for the annual budgetary needs. Um, having said that, uh, we as EXA, we will come the increased climate ambition uh, of, uh, of the fit for 55 climate package. We are fully aware of the crisis, of the climate crisis, and all its consequences, uh, which can be developed uh, to a wide humanitarian, uh, economic, but also uh, the impact of the climate change to the environment and the risk to the, di uh, the biodiversity. We are all aware, we recognize that shipping should contribute its fair share uh, to address this uh, climate crisis. Uh, and despite the fact that we are against any regional measures, uh, we will accept. We need though the undertaking from the EU that such a system should be ceased to exist as soon as a global market-based measure will come in force at an IMO level. Uh, Shipowners should not be in the position to pay twice. And of course, uh, the saying that uh, as soon as uh, IMO will implement the system, uh, then uh, member states will claim to uh, European Commission and then the discussion will start to see that this will take long. I think we need an undertaking from the beginning that as soon as uh, a system is in place on a global base at IMO level, uh, any UETS will, uh, should have to uh, cease uh, to exist. Uh, on a different perspective now, uh, we believe that European ship owners uh, notice already a lack of consistency among uh, of the proposals uh, uh, of the package. 
uh, which we believe may undermine objectives and uh, the object, the environmental objectives, and therefore we urge uh, for more consistency. Uh, I will refer to few of those on fuel EU uh, later on. Uh, it is uh, therefore uh, welcome that uh, in the, in the proposal of the July 14th, uh, there are quite a number of, of uh, points of extra that have been already incorporated in the in the proposal, like like the phasing period, like the uh, investment of revenues in an innovation fund, which is a new mandate, and also the recognition of the commercial operator uh, as a responsible entity in the recital uh, 20. Uh, of course, uh, very important was also that the directive ensures that the supply chain uh, uh, stakeholders may receive also proper incentives to make climate conscious decisions. What is missing though is a legal requirement in the articles to address that the commercial operator is a responsible entity. And then uh, the final decision of a sector specific uh, fund, although this has been recognized by the impact assessment, uh, it is not yet taken on board. And I mentioned quite a lot of uh, important aspects of the fund. Uh, I will mention another one that EU ETS on lab-based industries, all the revenues are, re are reinvested, no, 80% of the revenues are reinvested back to the, uh, the industry. So we want the same, uh, uh, to see the same happening uh, for shipping as well. Uh, going now to a few points on fuel EU is that uh, we will come uh, this initiative, uh, which encourage the market to take, uh, to uptake uh, cleaner fuels uh, that are currently not available in the market. However, the proposal does not seem to be fully consistent with the proposals of Fit, uh, 55, Fit for 55 climate package. Um, First is uh, incentivizing the uptake of biofuels purchased outside the EU could create an enforcement minefield putting at risk the achievement of emissions reduction. And this is a very worrying uh, part. There is also no alignment of fuel EU maritime with the renewable energy directive, which may, uh, makes the EU fuel suppliers responsible for making cleaner fuels available in the market and not the end users. Uh, therefore, uh, our opinion is that the scope should be limited within uh, EU. Uh, additional, what is important for us, we don't like the double, uh, double reporting or the, or the double requirements. Fuel EU maritime setups an additional uh, MRV system instead of extending the scope of the existing one. And the last point uh, refers to the onshore power supply. Uh, when the infrastructure for these OPS is not available in the port, I think we need that the ships must be accepted from uh, any OPS requirement. Uh, when especially the port uh, doesn't have the available, the infrastructure needed or is not compatible with the, the ship's facilities. Uh, I think I will stop here because I think uh, it is, now thank kicks of the controversial discussion. Th th thank you, Vilpos. And, and uh, Magda, I saw some furious note taking, and I'll give you a, a, a chance in a minute just to respond to some of that. But before you, I'm um, Hiro, could I just ask you quickly? There's been uh, various mentions of the IMO um, along the way. Um, just to take the, the, the IMO's perspective on, on, on what has been discussed. Okay, yeah, thank you, Simon, and thank you very much for inviting me for this session. Um, as you know, that in July this year, IMO's MEPC 76 adopted the MAPOL Annex 6 amendments related to short term measures aiming at 40% reduction of carbon intensity from international shipping by 2030, which are a combination of technical and operational measures. These measures will be implemented from 2023, and all the stakeholders must start preparation now. I think this was another important agreement in line with the initial IMO GHG strategy. After intensive negotiations among members over a year by uh, remote meetings with industry's expertise and input, as well as the support by the Secretariat. IMO has already um, commenced the consideration of mid-term measures, including MBMs. 
Um, ISWGH 10 in October and MEPC 77 in November will discuss concrete proposals of midterm measures based on work plan approved by MEPC 76. And ISWGH 9 this week will consider life cycle assessment guidelines for fuels, which will incentivize the use of low and zero carbon fuels. So um, it is not only the matter of what was uh, said, but uh, also what IMO has done and will do. At this moment, I should stop now. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Hiro. I, I think I'll come back to, to Magda um, the, to, to, to counter what uh, Philippis was, uh, was mentioning. Um, there, there were a few, uh, a few comments made there. Um, I think uh, very quickly in summary, um, enforcement me mechanics, um, inconsistencies, inconsistencies in fuel EU, uh, queries about sort of double charging, double counting, um, and, and, and various extraterritorial issues. So, so Magda, if you want to unpack some of that for us. Um, thank you, thank you very much, Simon. And and, and apologies uh, in particular to the audience if this this discussion may sound like uh, five people around the table are discussing one piece of legislation. That was that was not really my intention for the meeting because I think there are much more. Th there are different topics that fit into into the topic of of decarbonisation and the question of of costs that non decarbonising of shipping actually brings. But I do hope that we'll have a chance to come back to that. Um, um, and also to 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 maybe explain for, for, for those in the audience who may not necessarily be that familiar with, with how preparation of EU legislation works, it's preceded by, by quite an extensive uh, round of uh, public consultations, uh, bilateral meetings, discussions, so on and so forth. And fuel EU maritime proposal on which, on which Philippos focused his remarks uh, has been driven by two principles, well, among other high level political objectives to contribute uh, to decarbonization of shipping, but by two principles that were very, very clearly asked for in particular by the by the industry first of all that considering that we are in a in a in a situation where we don't yet have a clear technological winner of the decarbonization race and i think more importantly and that most people already agree we will possibly not just have one type of technological solution that will start reducing emissions in, in the shipping sector, the proposal should be as, as technologically neutral as possible. Hence, we focused on something that we hadn't done before in European legislation, the, uh, the, the target for the energy used on board of vessels. It sounds complicated, it is complicated until you read it and until you, you start looking at how it will work. Uh, at the same time, we also wanted to include a mechanism that will award those who are a bit more ambitious than the targets we put in the proposal. And by the way, one important comment. In the proposal, we have targets starting in 2030, going all the way to 2050. We tell what we believe should be the target in reduction of, of, of greenhouse gas content in fuels used by ships calling at EU ports all the way to 2050 exactly to respond to the, to the call that there needs to be a legal predictability. Ship owners, ship, ship owners in particular, have to know which ships they have to buy so that they can still do the operations in 2050 with all the question marks, with all the uncertainties. I do not agree with, Philipp with Philippos that there is no enforcement mechanism. Quite the contrary, we have an enforcement mechanism included because we know and we've learned the lesson from the sulfur, um, uh, from, from the sulfur requirements that without a solid enforcement mechanism, not only the sector will not like it, member states that are one of the two co-decision makers on the final shape of that proposal, together with European Parliament, member states would never accept such a proposal because they don't want to have piece of legislation that is non-enforceable and they find themselves in a very strange situation when, when controlling vessels during, during the port calls. Um, I think the, the, the other, the other um, important element, and thank you Philippos for, for bringing it up, the question on infrastructure uh, and the, the OPS availability or not, but in general infrastructure for alternative fuels. Uh, well, we know we need infrastructure, which is why we are putting on the table a separate proposal looking 
only at the question of infrastructure. That's what I referred to at the beginning when I talked about the basket of measures. It's not just ships, it's not just fuels, it's also infrastructure, it's also funding, it's also price for carbon. But it's actually easier to do one piece of legislation for alternative fuels across the entire transport sector and not just specifically for maritime to allow for synergies and to allow even more importantly, fuel producers to know what, what's coming to them. For that reason, this proposal actually is consistent with the Renewable Energy Directive because that's how we worked on the entire package of Fit for 55. But again, I could, and the other people, the other speakers know that I can talk forever. So I'm stopping here, but um, I, and, and, and of course we are, we are in a discussion with EXA and, and, and with, with other stakeholders also now when the proposal is on the table, but maybe just very, very last comment. We put the proposal on the table in mid-July. It, it will not happen overnight. It will not even happen probably over a year because there's a, a legislative process on the table. And there's also a bit of a leeway by the time the requirements of the proposal will start kicking in exactly to make sure that all those elements, how things should be reported, how things should be verified, how this reporting system of that proposal fits into the overall reporting established already under, under MRV, how the enforcement has to work. So all those elements have to be in place and checked before we start them, uh, uh, calling for, the, for, for, for requirements addressed at ships calling at the airport. I stop here, Simon, back to you. Yeah. Th thank you, Magda. And, and before we come back to the others, um, very quickly, Filipos, I, I don't want this to turn into the yeah, sorry, uh, I, I, Mag Magda show, but I mean, there is this question, uh, how, how is this paid for? I mean, who do you see paying for it um, in the first instance? And then how does that cost get pa gets passed through the supply chain system? Uh, very briefly, if you could, and then we'll go back to the others. Yeah, okay. Okay, but uh, um, before I I say the position of EXA, uh, I would like to know how can uh, fuel EU enforce or uh, verify the fuel mix, especially if you fuel outside miles. Uh, can, can, I, can I start? We'll come back to this. I just want to get the okay. Okay, uh, I'm going to say who will pay the bill now. This is a question, correct? Okay, EXA clearly suppose that the, the commercial operators should bear the cost of the UTS. There is a recital uh, in the UTS uh, proposal that makes it crystal clear that the commercial operator should be the responsible. And uh, in very, uh, very short, uh, the recital says, in line with the polluter pays principle, the shipping company could be means by means of a contractual agreement called the entity that is directly responsible for the decisions affecting the CO2 emissions of the ship accountable for the compliance costs under this directive. Uh, this entity could normally be the entity that is responsible for the change of fuel, the route, and the speed of the ship. And I will explain a little bit. As a ship owner, if I take a voyage operating my own ship, I will up to slow steam or uh, have a variable speed based on the weather conditions, follow an optimized route instead of the shortest, may better utilize my vessel uh, to be in just in uh, time arrival at the post, not to uh, speed up and emit the environment and then wait for five days uh, at the port. This will reflect also my CIIs. The annual uh, energy uh, emissions ratio and the uh, energy uh, efficiency operational index. By doing all those, I will gradually reduce and abide by the rules set uh, by the regulations set by IMO, uh, going uh, uh, as from 23 onwards. In the contrary, I cannot uh, impose to the charter to slow steam or to optimize its rule or to make a better utilization. Uh, or to do in just another is entirely its own decision. Therefore, we believe that the cost will be borne by the commercial operator and not anybody else. Um, of course, this brings us back to what I said before that all stakeholders must have the proper incentives to enable them uh, making environmental conscious decisions. Uh, this uh, recital 20, Send, uh, uh, sends a clear political message that the Commission 
is ready to discuss about the role of the commercial operator. We understand that the parliament and the council will take it from uh, there and will discuss concretely uh, legal text, but uh, uh, we, we are also aiming to be engaged in this uh, uh, dialogue uh, with the commission, uh, the parliament, the council of member states, uh, in order to have uh, a legal requirement in the articles of the directive so that the cost is passed to the commercial operator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go um, back to Guy now, if I may. Um, so, similar question. I mean, you, you mentioned earlier about the uh, the return to sector, but if, if, the, if the cost is falling on the commercial operator, how, how does that get um, passed down? Where does it end up falling ultimately? Uh, and then, whatever the scheme is, be it be it a, a, a fund, how how is it then returned back to sector in the right way? And and, and does that even matter? Is it the the carriage or the stick? <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> and ultimately, of course, society at large is that's going to have to pay for this. And I think that honest conversation is yet to be had with the general public. It's not just about our sector; it's everything. You know, you, we're hearing you know uh, stories of energy prices going up by 70 80 percent. And I think there's some very hard political uh, decisions that are going to have to be made. But ultimately, if we are going to decarbonize, society has to pay for that. We all have to pay for that. But at the moment, in terms of, of the fuels, it, it, it's clearly a ship operator, ship owner is going to have to pass those costs on because he, he can't in any way sustain that on his or her own. So the people who are paying for the fuel, charters and the like, will have to ultimately pay this. And that will have to be passed right the way through the supply chain. In terms of keeping it in sector, ideally, yes, we would do because there is a number of studies out there which shows if you can keep the money within the sector, you are much more likely to accelerate the decarbonisation. If that money goes outside the sector, and, I, and I'm sure lots of finance ministers around the world will, will eye their potential of billions of dollars to come into the coffers, does that actually help matters? Does it actually help the decarbonisation? And I think that's a fundamental question we have to ask ourselves. Are we really serious about decarbonisation or not? As an industry, we are. We, we absolutely got that and, and we're keen to do it. So, yes, it does matter where that money ends up. If it goes out of the sector, it'll take longer to decarbonise. Keeping it in sector so we can then reinvest in the infrastructure. Magda's talked about that and I look forward to seeing those proposals. But we need that infrastructure. We also need to have commitments from governments in terms of the production of these zero carbon fuels. I agree with Magda. I don't think it's going to be a one size fits all here. I think we'll have a, a, a smorgasbord of, of different fuels from batteries to ammonia to hydrogen to methanol, all sorts of different types, maybe even nuclear um, fuels as well. But, um, uh, you know, ultimately, we need to have the assurance that industry, the energy industry is geared up to actually produce these. And I think the other thing to, to bear in mind is at the moment, and you can say it's a criticism of our sector or not, that we, we burn the fuel that no one else really wants generally. We're going to be competing in the same marketplace as everybody else, be it the steel industry in Germany or anywhere else, for the same zero carbon fuels. And I do wonder whether that honest conversation is being had with society at large. It's actually, um, and I think Lars Robert, I mean, was it the entire production of Denmark would just about fuel these eight ships being ordered? I mean, you know, we're talking about 65,000 ships. So it's an incredible challenge. And industry can't do it on its own. We need to work together. But are we committed to it? Yes, we are. Who should pay for it? All of us will end up paying for it. But if we can keep the money raised to a levy in sector, it will help and accelerate the decarbonisation. Back to you, Simon. Thanks very much. Um, Lars Robert, if I could bring you in then. Uh, similar, where, where does cost end up falling ultimately? Um, How is it returned to sector? In, in what way? Uh, and, and does it matter, um, carrot versus stick, if I can summarise the question that way? Thank you, Simon. And, 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 and firstly, let me, uh, let me just say I, I totally agree with, with Guy here that, that, you know, there is no way ship owners, even that uh, often ship owners are portrayed as, as people who, uh, who, who have uh, their, their coffers filled with endless uh, streams of, of money. I can, I can assure you that's not the fact. And no one in the industry can sustain this bill uh, on their own. There's no way that you can sustain the uh, the carbon price from the from the general freight rates uh, out there in the market. So there's no doubt that this cost will have to be passed on. You know, 
in the first instance to the charters and, and so forth, and they will need to 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 uh, pass it further down the the chain, and 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 the whole of society will have to to lift up to this uh, extra cost level of of everything we're doing, because that's the that's the ultimate. Uh, outcome of, of the uh, climate change agenda, there's no doubt about it, uh, unless, of course, uh, some magic uh, solution suddenly comes about. But uh, uh, I think we could not rely on that uh, right now. The question is then, how do we drive the, the transition in the industry? And, and you know, I, I, th I think, you know, most, most people in the industry would, would, would agree with me that the, the most, uh, you know, the best solution we could find would be full subsidization of the new fuels for, by, by the society, because then we will operate at a, at a fair level and we can gradually transition as we see fit without any extra cost, uh, at least seemingly uh, in, in the industry. I'm sure that is not going to happen. So <clears throat> what other options do we have? The other end of the spectrum is the, uh, the, the full-blown carbon price. Uh, added on uh, to uh, those uh, fuels that do not comply with the uh, uh, with the uh, zero emission um, goal, and that will be hugely expensive. Still, uh, we will be operating up here at you could say still at a fair uh, in fair competition in in the market, but it will be hugely expensive uh, for everyone to do that. Uh, and, and likely, as uh, as Guy was saying, because the money disappears out of the uh, of the industry in that concept, uh, it will take uh, potentially longer to to accomplish the transition. We could also redistribute the money uh, between you know those who pay and those who receive uh, within the industry. And when I say within the industry, probably we have to go a little bit beyond just the. The ship owners here, the the, uh, the those industries who actually supply the solutions to to uh, to our industry will have to be part of that redistribution game, but but uh, that would seem to accelerate the transition. But of course, uh, the the finance ministers, as Guy was saying, would be less happy with the solution because they would have less money to redistribute for other purposes, such as being, being re-elected at, at the next general election, if that would be the case in those countries. So, I mean, there, there are many questions out here, but, but you know, the fact of the matter is that it will cost a lot of money and the money is not something that you, you, can, you can just dream up from any one party out there. It will be the whole of society that will have to basically foot the bill in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Magda, I'll come to you in a minute just to talk about a bit about, if I may, the, this carrot and stick and idea and, and to develop the, um, the ETS uh, marketplace. Uh, but before I do, I just wanted to bring um, Hiro um, back in on the IMO because um, I guess, I mean, we, we, we've heard about um, uh, the the um, observing regulations and complying with regulations and and the carrot and the sticker approach. Of course, um, the ultimate body is the IMO, and, and and it's it's sometimes the elephant in the room about uh, the challenges the IMO itself faces in in which regulations to pass and and, and how to pass them and when. Um, could I just get you very quickly to to, to comment on that? Yeah, well, thank you, Simon. And as a global regulatory body, IMO needs agreement among its uh, 174 member states, consisting of both developing and developed countries. And climate change is a global and complex issue. And naturally there are divergent views among members on how to reduce GHG emissions from shipping. Hence, we need more dialogue and cooperation among member states, IGOs and NGOs. The IMO will further facilitate such dialogues. When looking back at IMO's the more than 60 years history, IMO has always reached solutions owing to IMO's spirit of cooperation. I believe IMO will also be able to achieve its goals related to GHG reduction step by step. Furthermore, IMO has been conducting various TC and capacity building activities to reduce GHG emissions from ships based on its fund and generous donors to ensure no one left behind. And I'd like to mention about the market-based measures and we will consider um, soon. But um, of course, there are several the market-based measures, uh, this levy system and that uh, the emission trading system. But uh, our way would be to how to say, analyze the each uh, several the, uh, the mechanisms and um, 
to what is the purpose and what is the character and more importantly, what is the efficiency, effectiveness to reduce GHG from shippings based on such MBM and the impact um, to the society. And in doing uh, such uh, assessment, I think we can um, be reaching that uh, the um, appropriate uh, mechanism. And um, as, you, as I mentioned, uh, according to our work plan, um, within probably, hopefully one, and a, one year, we can uh, assess and um, the appropriate the measures and then and we can decide upon uh, which way to go. So that's something we are considering at IMO. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then, uh, Magda, in, in light of that, um, uh, to just to ask you about the carrot and the stick and the, and the, the trading ETS. Thank you, thank you very much. And can I, can I, can I immediately, uh, can I, can I start by referring to what Hiro just said and just thank him because because he did mention some of the very important elements that it may look like maybe we 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 all of us here on this panel and those who are involved in discussions and potentially decision making when it comes to decarbonization of shipping that we don't have it in front of us. But this question of coming up with a measure at a global level that we will really take into account different needs and different situation in which 174 members of IMO find themselves will probably almost certainly be the most difficult thing for, 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 for IMO to agree upon also because we are talking here about money because on the one hand we have this technical measure the fuel standard which will be complicated but IMO has proven itself for so many years to be to be excellent when it comes to technical regulations but on the other hand we will have this this carbon pricing pricing means there is money coming in pricing means there is potentially money to be obtained and and how to choose which carbon pricing mechanism will work better at the IMO level will be indeed one of the super challenging debates that are that are ahead of us and I, and I really and I really uh, applaud uh, Hiro for for using the, the phrase that we need a carbon pricing mechanism that will lead to effective reduction of greenhouse gas emissions because it is not about paying money for the sake of paying money it is about having a system where somehow paying that money will also lead to reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions. We have a system at the European level, we have the emission trading scheme. One important, uh, one key important uh, element of that system is that it's a system that covers the entire economy. Shipping is not on its own. Uh, the price of, of, of um, emissions uh, is the same across the entire group of sectors that are covered by ETS. We, I'll be very honest, and if you read, if you read uh, impact assessments, uh, you will see that there has been this discussion whether we should go and come up with a separate ETS system only for ships. But what it would lead to would be immediately a very high price for carbon, because at this moment, uh, we, we are not yet there with, with all technological solutions for all shipping sectors. And it's also actually fairer to put shipping in the same, in the same boat, if I may say so, as the, as the rest of economy when it comes to, to emission trading. But maybe one point which, which was sort of a little bit in the, in the, in the background of some of, some of the statements. Um, and I think, I think Filippos actually pointed to it uh, straightforwardly. This, this interlinkages between, between what's happening at the European level and what will be happening at the, at the IMO level. Already a year ago in, in, in one of the resolutions, IMO did uh, recognize that there, there can be national or regional measures put forward to speed up the pace of, of, of decarbonization of shipping in a way it's easier to go faster at the, at, the, at the regional level than it is at the global level, as we, just, as we just discussed. But both Fuel EU proposal and ETS have a very clear indication that the moment there will be a decision reached at the global level, will make sure that the system fits together and that there is no double pricing, double payment, and so on and so forth. But for that, 
to start happening, we absolutely need that agreement at the global level. And I can assure you that both EU member states and the Commission, the European Union will work very constructively and openly with the IMO to reach that as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Guy, Guy you can raise your hand. I can give you about 30 seconds, I think. Oh, we're very, very brief. Uh, thanks, Maggie, for that. We need our leadership, our politicians, to now show proper leadership, ambition, pragmatism, and actually come up uh, with practical policy ideas which will work. And, and you know, we can we put forward our own suggestions. Otherwise, it just becomes political rhetoric, and and that's not actually going to uh, assist us in decarbonisation. So yes, it is going to be difficult, but we need that leadership to make it happen, and and we look to uh, our political leaders for that leadership. Thank you. I'm just circling back around my screen. Lars, Robert, 30 seconds to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, th th there seems to be this tendency that uh, that to deal with the lack of action, you strengthen the uh, the targets. Uh, rather, we think it, it's more productive to actually concentrate on actions rather than always discuss how we could potentially do more when we're actually not even doing what we set forth last year to do. So actions is the key word here. Thank you. And um, Philippos, I'll give you the last 30 seconds. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, take some uh, out of the newsletter of political today, some of the commission's uh, most experienced politicians are warning of the political dangers inherent in implementing the EU's uh, climate plan, uh, even as process seeks uh, to be the global leader on climate change. There are concerns about the potential for the EU white uh, yellow movement and fears that the EU citizens uh, could uh, possibly blame Brussels for rising prices. I'm afraid uh, that the ship owners have no possibility to dress their ships with yellow jackets. Therefore, our way forward is the open dialogue with the regulators with the aim to address all these issues and conclude to viable and affordable regulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and we have to wish you the best of luck with those discussions. And uh, Nicholas, you have popped up back on my screen. Well, it has been a phenomenal discussion, as expected. Uh, this is such a hot topic and such an important topic. And thank you to all for a tremendous uh, insight and contribution. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. To be continued. Have a good thank afternoon. You thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.